I'm here with Sam Patuzzi, the one and only Britallion. How are you, old chap? I'm very good. Thank you very much. I thought we'd Great. dive back online before we lose any more viewers since that awesome stream with Jonathan Weinberger a moment ago. Now, my yeah. problem is I've been standing here gobbing off to Twitch. Sorry, Sam, say, go ahead. I was, I was, I was watching in. It's very, very cool. It was cool. We have an unstable stream at the moment, so let's not say anything oh, valuable just for a second. Oh, don't worry. I don't think there's too much of that I going think, on. I, yeah, I don't think we need to make any special amends to avoid value. Um, and then we're <laughs> going to be going through Unreal with you guys, taking a look behind the scenes of Unreal and kicking off the series of Unreal streams. So Perceptual Lucidity yeah. says hi. We've got some real hardcore stream attendees here. I, uh, they seem to leave yeah, their computer. Yeah, I applaud you all for, for sticking with us. While we're yeah. working all of that. It's been crazy. This uh, I've been streaming fairly constantly all day today. So I do need to go and get myself a drink and remind my wife that I'm still alive. While Sam gathers your opinions about your, your questions and opinions about Unreal. Try and resist answering yeah. them, Sam, but maybe jot them all down or something like that. Yeah, I will uh, I will take them and put them into a doc or something. Yeah, stuff stuff them in a Google Doc and give me the link and then and then I can help to guide the stream without you having to keep diving back into the doc. Something yeah, that makes like sense. That. Yep, it's great to keep you guys company. We're serving all sorts of needs here. And remember, when we get to 40 minutes, what happens in the chat? What happens when we get to 40 minutes? I always stop you and do a... Poor old Jonathan. I made him do a stretch break as well. <laughs> <sighs> so, you like our right. stretch breaks. Yep. I'll be back in a second, guys. Okay. So, um, in the meantime, while Ben is gone, I would like you guys to be sharing with me things that you find exciting about Unreal and questions that you have about Unreal, maybe from a beginner's point of view. And uh, we will be answering those, not immediately, but through the course of the stream. So go ahead and get your questions in early. So how many people have we got with us at the moment? We've got almost 60 people, that is great. Well, hello, all 60 of you. We're looking forward to doing some, uh, some streaming uh, of Unreal content. That's what you're here for, I suppose. So I'm just going to be putting together your questions in a document. Maybe I can share my screen while we're doing this. Close the tabs to the right. And let's see if I can share. Oh, will it just let me? OK. So I'm putting together a set of questions about Unreal. And it's currently blank because none of you asked anything yet. <laughs> yes, irresistible jelly. I'm not used to recording things live. Let's put it this way. So basically, uh, we have a lot of control over the pause button when you're recording lectures. And that is quite a comfort, let me tell you. But I think it's all right. I've done a few live things before. And yeah, once we get to 3,000 views, I think the thing is, it really won't make a difference at that point. I don't think you can imagine 3,000 viewers unless they're sitting in front of you. So uh, well, we'll see. Maybe I will feel very nervous. So we've got a first question. Dement PH. Demente? Demente PH? Uh, is Unreal more commonly used than Unity by Game Dev Studios? Good question. Let's talk about that. Not right now. I'm going to save it up for a question for a rainy day, well, for later on, though you have got that one stored in. Anyone else? What's better to learn at to enter the industry? Ooh, that's kind of a follow-up question to that one, isn't it? Keep the questions coming. And what we're going to do is we're going to be doing a little bit of a tour of Unreal. I'll share this one with you, Ben. I'll stop sharing my screen for now. Awesome. So as the questions come up, we can collate them in that doc. And job is a good. And how are you sharing that with me, Slack or something? Uh, probably. I'll just get a link. Which Zoom room? I'll lock this Zoom room, I think, so that we don't have... Well, actually, you're the only one of our team who would care about arriving at this Zoom room. The only other risk is that Mikey arrives shirtless, which would be a, a disaster, but also very funny. So, yeah. So that's all right. There you go. I think I shared it with you, I think. Noise Phoenix, thank you very much indeed for joining with Twitch Prime. You probably know most of you on the stream that you can link your Amazon Prime account, and yada, yada, yada. Okay, questions I will collate over here. Um, let's really just look through the engine, Sam. Do you want to share your, your screen in a minute? Screen? Ah! Screen. Ah! 
Thank How you. important is it to keep that's, a good Git Thanks. repository from Abyss Films? Completely important, basically. It doesn't have to be Git, yeah. but you you There's need nothing to be more using important, version. basically. Yeah, you need to be using some version control. All right, so let me share my pixels. Okay. How did so, Irresistible Jelly, how did you make your font red like that? That was rather clever. So yeah, let's take oh, a look at the, like, the um, IRC type thing. He's done Me. something. He's a he's a clever boy, isn't he? All right. So Ben, help me. I'm stuck here on the Epic Games launcher. What do I do next? Oh yeah, Sam. There is no Sam emote. You need to make your little emote. Pick. Remember the, the email. Oh, uh, okay. I haven't seen they're that. Getting, they're getting. Why is that not a task in Asana? Yeah. I think there <laughs> is, or if there isn't, there's an email. Anyway, let's, an let's, let's go into Unreal. Is, is there anything to be learned here for a start? Or, or do we just, now we get into the engine, right? Occasionally, we have blog posts here, and they're very cool, and you should read them. That's good. That's it. That yeah, and we've got um, 4.20 coming out soon, but not yet, which is going to be fun, because it fixes a few bugs that are really annoying in 4.19, like if you change something in your C++, sometimes it likes to just obliterate all the uh, all the settings you've set in your blueprints. That's fun. Not, not a fun bug. OK, so shall we start with a completely fresh project, or shall we dive into something that I have been doing recently? Uh, let's have a look maybe at Battle Tank. But it's not really just reviewing Battle Tank. What I want to try and do in this stream is get into the darker corners of just just so that Battle Tank just so there's a project open rather than a blank engine. But um, let's have a look at some of the the other corners of Unreal that people may not know exist. Some of the things that are hidden behind interface that you may not immediately get to. You know, um, yeah. let's have a look at some of these because some of these things aren't that easy to get to. You know, there's a lot of information hiding going on in here in Unreal. So let's look at some of the weird corners. The some of the animation scripting, the matinee system, the you know, the some of the UI stuff. Just just start taking us through. And guys in the chat. Well, tell this us is the you. interesting thing, isn't it? That um, in you can go through a lot of Unreal without touching certain areas of it at all, and they can be really strange and different. So some examples. Let's think. Because also, I will have forgotten a lot of them if I haven't touched them in a while. Exactly. Well, that's fine. So, this is a good. A great place to look for things that you don't know about is the Windows editor. So they tend to have a lot of different, uh, I guess you'd call them editors in Unity that allow you to do different stuff. So getting a lot of chat comments about hair right now. So um, it's saying that if I've just guaranteed them, if they learn Unreal, their hair will get as good as yours. Hey, why aren't you saying it's as good as mine? Mine's kind of even and cool. Okay, it's a little thinning, but yeah. So here's an overview. So, I mean, you know, we've got a whole, look at the development tools there for a start. Maybe we start there just for fun. Just have a look, we'll look mm. at some of these development tools, super powerful stuff built right in. So some of the stuff that's unusual and that you probably don't see on Unity, what have we got here? What's this pixel inspector? I have no idea. Let's have a look. Uh, so new corner of Unreal, that's exactly what we wanted. So I think it's literally just looking at a context of pixels. So here's a coordinate. Have a look at a coordinate, see the final color, see the scene color, whatever that is. Um, I presume before any post-processing effects are applied to it. So the post-processing stuff is actually quite, um, I think, quite important. Let's see if we've got any post-processing in this world outliner. Yeah, so we've got some post-processing volume here. A light mass importance volume, that tends to have something to do with post-processing. But I don't think we've actually got a full-on post-processing volume here. So one thing we can do is put in a post-processing volume. And see what, what it can do for us, maybe. Okay, there's post-processing volume. <clears throat> One of the things we've got here that is coming to Unity, but is currently pretty unique to Unreal, is the ability to separately edit your, uh, you've got a whole edit suite for your blueprints, which would be the equivalent to prefabs in Unity. So if you click on like edit more to BP, for instance, that would be a, a whole new interface level of quality that you just don't have in Unity. Here's a new one. Yeah, so this, so this you have to do in the, in Unity, you have to do that in the, in the editor, right? Basically just, 
just within here and save it back to the prefab. Yeah. Whereas you start so here, you, you've got that option. You can edit your mortar BP right here, and then you can save it back to the prefab, or you can go and edit just the root mortar, or you can go and edit the C++ class that that's based off of. Lots and lots of options. And then you obviously have got Blueprint, which if you've heard anything about and really probably heard about Blueprint, they get spoken in the same in the same breath often. And the idea behind Blueprint is that you have got this visual scripting language that is a little bit easier for a designer to pick up, but it's still programming essentially. But I guess because it's visual and you don't have to worry about syntax, it's often easier for non-programmers to get into, just be a little less afraid about. So that's fantastic. It's basically a programming language and you are able to program a blueprint in the same way as you're able to program a C++ class. It's the same thing. So yeah, you can literally lay out all your stuff here and obviously one of the features that it's got that Unity doesn't have is that you can nest these things. So you could create a... Although it's about to have, component. just before people slam that in the chat, by the way. Unity is about to have that, but, but at the Absolutely. moment it does not. But Unreal's had it for a very long time. Yep. Cool. Uh, so I was having a look at the post-processing volume, and you can see that there's a load of settings here in terms of the type of lens effects we can do. So we can put chromatic aberration. And I know you can do some of this in Unity 2, but it's just super simple to just enable a post-processing volume. And I think you have to have your camera inside it. And what's the, the what? T tell us a bit more about the post-processing volume while you're setting it up, just so people know what the- Yeah, so the post-processing volume yeah, is basically what makes, I think, Unreal games seem to stand out in terms of graphics quality. It tends to be the kind of bloom effects, the, uh, let's have a look at what kind of things you've got. Oh, uh, col color grading, for example, so making uh, a scene look particularly moody or particularly bright. These kind of tweak tweaks and finishing touches that are very make your game just look a, a notch better in terms of graphics quality even if your meshes or your textures aren't any better um, sometimes putting on some decent post processing can have a very good effect so i'm just trying to see if we can uh, increase the saturation or something and whether i have to play in order to see this of course we've got post processing in unity as well just for, for, for means of contrast um, it's just that Unreal tends to out the box look better than Unity. Yeah. So some of the bits of the engine we just haven't played with at all are things like the sat, um, uh, really as a group yet, the cinematic area sides of the engine. Um, the, the, the we've got a whole engine ragdoll physics. We're not spending a lot of time on, although I think you did a little bit of that in uh, in testing. Uh, no, not not really. But I did have a project um, somewhere. Where what I'd like to it. just get into is some of the, the you know, the seat, the, the sequencer, some of the bits, the corners of it, we don't normally, that we don't normally touch just to try and interest people. Just yeah. to... Okay. So let's see if I can bring up, if I knew what we'd been covering before this 15 minutes before the stream began, I would have got the right projects downloaded. Uh, it's all right. It's good to keep you on the, keep you on your toes. We don't necessarily, oh, here comes some food. Look at that. What is that? Shake this, my. Thank you very much, honey. This is my first food today, guys, so I'm going to eat it slightly off to the side of the camera, but I will still be present. I'll just stop my video, actually. It's probably the best bet. Thank you, honey. That's honey well, wife and honey son, that is. So Sam will get a couple of projects projects downloading there. Sam, the suspension you created on Battle Tank, what, um, that was pretty interesting. What, 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 what were you using there in terms of the springs and the physics, etc.? How did that work out? Yeah, so what we've got there... That's chromatic aberration is now kind of annoying. If we have a look at a tank, um, go ahead and play and see for those who don't know what, what this is about, if they haven't done a battle tank section. Uh, this is the tank with its suspension, and it basically has a kind of 
fake set of colliders here. Well, they're not fake. The colliders are real, but they don't respect necessarily where the wheel positions are. And the idea here is that you're able to traverse the terrain nice and smoothly because previously we had lots of popping issues. You'd reach a terrain boundary and it would jump up because we were basically taking a tank that was completely solid and dragging it across a terrain. So you can imagine if you come up to a cusp in a terrain, even if it's just a small one and you've got a completely rigid tank, it's going to bounce into, into nowhere when you hit that cusp. So adding suspension is a, is a way of doing this. It's a way of absorbing shocks and smoothly going over bumps in the terrain. And that's what we have created. So I'm gonna go over into the tank blueprint. Let's bring this one up. And you can see a little bit about how, how much there is going on under the hood past this, this initial scene setup. We've got a tank blueprint, which is basically the tank object, sensor tank in the world. And we can see there we've got some left, some left tracks and right tracks and each one of these has a spawn point. And these spawn points are actually components that we've made. And what they do is basically doing a nested prefab style thing, except they do it at runtime. So it's a bit of custom code and it spawns another blueprint, which is the sprung wheel. So I can go ahead and open up the sprung wheel. Which is again, another blueprint again it's just a different class and what we've got here is a set of physics constraints so this is something built right into the engine this idea of a physics constraint and what this is doing is it's connecting let's see if we can get a good look at it it is connecting the ball collider this wheel collider to whatever the parent object we attached it to, which is the tank in this case. And it is connecting it to, a, there's an axle object actually in between, which allows us to do a rolling physics. So this collider can roll in one particular direction. In fact, if I select the axle wheel constraint, the constraint between the, this axle object and this wheel object, you can kind of see what its degrees of freedom are. You can see that this, circle is saying it can basically rotate around the y-axis but it can't rotate around any of the other axes which is really helpful because it means that our tank can roll down a hill but it can't roll sideways down a hill let me show you if we can if i've got the level for testing this out spring test bed so here you go i've got a an inclined plane basically and i can go ahead and hit play and what you notice is that the tank isn't going down the hill sideways only backwards basically and if we change the rotation of this a little bit and we should see that it probably stays uh, change the rotation in the other direction it might have helped I'm just going to re reset the rotation entirely and then we can rotate the way we want it to. Like this. Ha. Spawning from where I currently am. There we go. There we go. So you can see it's not rolling downhill. That's because of this physics constraint. And the physics constraint basically says even without these two objects being linked in any other way, it's going to try and use the physics engine underlying Unreal to keep these objects as close as possible to satisfying this constraint. And what we've got then is a whole chain of constraints between the wheel and the axle, which is doing the rotation, and then between the axle and the tank itself, this mass wheel constraint, which is basically acting as a spring. So if you apply a force to it, it compresses and it has a bit of damping so it doesn't oscillate around. So if you have bad suspension, it's going to bounce around or oscillate. And all of that is built right in 
And in fact, this physics constraint, the f constraint that underlies the physics constraint, uh, it's in the PhysX engine, the NVIDIA library, in actual fact, is exactly what's used in the ragdoll physics for characters. So that's what I have got downloading here in the content example. Hopefully I'll be able to show you what the ragdolls do and what they look like, because that could be quite cool. And awesome, I think Sam, we've had a request um, we've had a request to see some VR development as well. And as you're right in the middle of producing the Unreal VR course, which I'll link in the chat, it'd be good to see that if, if, if you're in a context to do that. Definitely. So we can go over to one of those projects. Let's see. Probably already have one open here. OK. So at the moment, the stage we're at in the VR course is that we've got some kind of placeholder UI. Not very impressive UI, if I go ahead and hit play. Get my headset. Right, I'm gonna look like a right tool with a headset on. Okay, so what we've got here is um, some, I've been practicing or been showing people how to do VR setups. So we've got a main content area. Is this all coming through all right? Because I can't quite see. Yeah, yep, we can so. see you fine, Sam. Somebody's going to need to clip uh, clip Sam in his VR headset because he looks really interesting like that. He looks like something out of the Borg. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a um, main area, and the this area is where we usually put tool tips and things like that. And so what we've got going on here is that this is World Space UI. It's, it's a widget component inside the world. And here I've got a hand controller. You can just about see there's no actual light in this scene, so it's just a silhouette. But it has got a pointer on the end of it, which allows us to interact with UI widgets in the world. So it's just about visible. But if I hover over this button, can you see it changing, Ben? Can you see it changing to a hover color? Yeah, just about. Just about see that hover effect, yep. It works on both of these, and you can even use the trigger to basically press the button. So this is where we've got to. It's going to look more impressive than this. In fact, I can probably bring up the project that looks more impressive than this. So I open the completed project, which will take a little second. So this is one of the advantages of Unity, though, is that things take a lot less time to load. But Unreal is quite a heavy editor. When you're developing an, an, in uh, VR with Unreal, how much of your time are you spending with the VR headset on versus off, do you reckon? Does it, does it tend to live on your forehead like that? No, it, well, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. So it's better to have the Oculus, I find, than the Rift, because the Rift weighs a ton and my neck hurts if I keep it on. But yeah. the, uh, Hold on, the quite... Oculus than, yeah, than the Rift? You mean than the Gear VR? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, Spurs, uh, there, there. Yeah, the other one, the HTC Vive. It's very, very heavy. So this is what it kind of is aiming towards. So you just saw the UI as it was blocked out, but then you can see here quite clearly that we're able to highlight different elements of the UI, that we've got buttons down here that allow us to add and delete paintings from the UI. We can go into any one painting and draw in the UI. So all that sort of stuff. That's where it's going. And I just wanted to show you, there is an interesting thing or two we can do with VR that is, I think, quite exclusive to Unreal at this point, is that you can do a VR mode. So VR mode basically means I am still in the editor. This isn't me playing my game. But if I can get my other hand controller. Uh, let's have them both. And I can never quite remember all the controls. So you can see here, hopefully you can see here, that I've got um, an in-editor in VR system that allows me to do things like move stuff around. So if I click on the gizmos, do the translate gizmo, so I click or not. It's a little bit temperamental, I find. It's very early days for it. So what I should be able to do is select elements in 
the world around me. Maybe I need to go to something like Apple Tank. It might be more obvious because we've actually got 3D environment rather than just UI. So I always forget how I have to come out of this thing. Something like system exit. There you go. And it comes out of the VR mode. So if we try and do it from Battle Tank, that should be interesting. If I go to the battleground itself, and we can try and edit things, go into VR mode. Here we go. Oh, I'm quite high up. That's that's quite a vertigo inducing. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay, so you can see a little bit better in this level that I've got two kind of silvery hand controllers. And they actually allow me to select objects. And you can see I'm moving the world around within VR. So this is really good for a designer because it basically allows you to, to lay things out as you're going to experience them in the game, very much as the editor is supposed to do. But obviously, when you're editing things in 2D on a screen, it's going to look different to when you're going to experience them in VR. So you can even do things like add in windows here. So I could get the details pane. Here you go. Here's a details pane in VR. And I select something in the world. Maybe I select something in the world and it will show up. We'll come back to that. I'm trying to remember how it is that I'm supposed to move. Aha, that's it. So squeezing these triggers, I can change the scale of the world. I think I'm zooming, but I'm not entirely sure. There you go. So I can zoom out a little bit on scale, and you can see it's. I don't know whether you can tell that the scale seems to have changed. Does it look different? Because to me, this tank is now minute. It's a little, little bit of a. Yeah, no, it does. It does, and it's just a question of field of view, probably, isn't it? It probably is a field of view thing, but it's also going to be the stereoscopic vision to some degree. So here we are. I'm up to the tank. That tool of yours looks like a lightsaber, Sam. It's great. Yeah, a little kind of wobbly lightsaber, right? Yeah, wobbly uh, lightsaber. For some reason, I can't seem to select the objects in this view. Maybe I don't have the right tool selected. Oh, my a fence, word. A fencing think, person would probably call it a light foil, I think, or something like that. So. It's a light foil. <laughs> On guard. <laughs> On guard, yeah. exactly. Awesome. So we've got a VR editor, which is which is cool, but a bit new. Um, where would that really excel? It would probably excel if you're trying to build a, a, a VR, first-person VR experience. And especially if you're trying to ex build an experience that's quite close-knit and you want to really get the sizing of it right, like you're building yeah, something that's quite it's claustrophobic. Very Gen generally in, in VR, actually, because it's so hard to get the scales right until you've actually stepped in in, in VR. And you want to put things like, is this thing within hand's reach is very important. Whether, yeah, whether you can, whether you can touch something from here or not, whether you have to move over here. So generally, use of space in VR is very, very important. It's just leaner, of course, to do it this way. So that, that's the thing. Yeah. Awesome. All right. How's your content demo coming on if we wanted to move on to a different different feature of Unit Unreal? Yep. Uh, People are starting to feel a bit okay. sick from the stream, I think, because of its, um, the amount it's moving around. Keeping an eye on the chat over here for you guys. Yeah, okay, that's, uh, that's, that's probably enough. Let's stop sharing that. <laughs> no, seriously, that's, it's uh, nauseating now. So I, unfortunately, I have to do it from within VR. No, no, the, the VR editor key is not something we... Uh, we be... Dude, can you... Ah, oh, man, I'm going to move I'm this trying. off the screen for a minute. There you go. I moved it Dude. off the screen for you guys before you get sick. So it's until between now and when Sam stops sharing his screen, stops sharing that, I'm going to hide okay. it on the stream, Sam, because it's really nauseating for us lot. Yeah, yeah. I just can't. I can't disable it without going into VR. So. Ah, I see. That's really weird, isn't it? So once in VR, you're sta you're staying in VR, right? Yeah. No worries. So that VR editor is not something we built. It's something that's coming. It's new into Unreal. I'm really interested in the idea of VR blueprint, three-dimensional blueprint, but um, I don't know mm. if they're going there or when they'll go there, but I think that's... They will at some point. At the moment, the VR editor is mainly a designer 
only feature. So the idea being that uh, the designers go in and tweak blueprint variables, but even changing things like numbers in the VR editor is still a little bit buggy. It's still early days for it. Very useful. So is that, can you show us an area, because not all of Unreal is available immediately off the front end like that. Can you show us something that really surprised you when you got into it? Where like you got you got into something and it's like, whoa, there's all this suddenly, like an animator or Yeah, so I would like to do that, but we have to get the content examples, which has downloaded. So let's open oh, up the content awesome. examples. There's a bunch of levels in here. Basically, if you go to this add new menu, you can see all the types of asset that you can create. There's loads of them. So these are just the top assets, but there's all these animation assets you can see. Oh, load up a different editor. So we've got aim offsets, uh, we've got animation blueprints, blend spaces, pose assets, animation montages. That's just animation. Then we've got AI, artificial intelligence. So we've got behavior trees and blackboards. We've got, obviously, you can create materials. So let me show you a bit of material editing, because actually, you can't do this in, in Unity, I believe. You have to use their programming languages. They've got no sort of visual material editor. Although it is, it is that is very much here or here stroke coming right now. But yeah, it, it has been has been. Do they have a visual material editor? That is, I'm not sure whether it's here or coming, but which exactly which version with shader graph? But it's pretty much here, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is the material editor in VR, and it is just a node-based editor like many of the other editors, and. What you can do is you can build up using mathematical expressions, essentially, all the different properties of a material, such as its base color, its metallicness, roughness, emissive colors, and things like that, so that you end up with very cool looking materials like this. And you get Epic and Games' that, car park as the, as the skybox, which is quite interesting. Yeah, that is really strange. <laughs> yeah, so their car park is the skybox. So obviously someone was like, we need a skybox, quick. Where can we go and get a skybox? Quick, nip down to the car park. So that's the kind of thing. And yeah, you can use, you can connect up textures. So here's here's kind of one of the underlying textures that's being used as a mask. You can see they're using the different color channels, splitting out the color channels. They're going into different mathematical expressions here, such as clamping power, etc. A base emissive color, and then it's emitting that into here. And you can preview many of these nodes just by clicking on them, I think. So I can right click on it and do a start previewing node. And after a little bit of time, there you go, it tells you what the output of that single expression is, which is really quite handy if you're building up these materials. So it's a little, just a little bit of a taster of what you can do with materials. They're quite handy. Then let's have a look at some of the other cool stuff. Here in this project, this is an excellent project, by the way. If you ever want to see how certain things are done in Unreal, then go and have a look at the content examples. And then you want to go into the Maps folder and look for whatever kind of topic you want to talk about or want to find out about, because these levels have been set up to showcase the great features that Unreal has. We've got great landscaping features, great outdoor landscaping features. So let's have a look at some of this. So here is the landscape. We saw it in Battle Tank as well, to some extent. But uh, landscape is just something that we can paint on in the editor. It's just loading the shaders here. And you can see, actually, if I zoom out, it has done some level of detailing because the mesh is changing slightly. As I come in, the detail on the mesh Kind of comes out, pops up a little bit, and improves. And you can do all sorts of things like painting onto this terrain, different layers. So a bit unpracticed with this, I'm afraid. It's something that we do cover in the Battle Tank tutorial. You can see that there's like a soil layer, a grass layer, a snow layer, and these have different properties, including different properties such as slip. So you might have the snow layer have uh, less friction you can do things like that, which is pretty cool. And you can use paint tools, I think, like this. If you have to change the size of this brush, the brush size is huge. Uh, the strength of the brush needs to increase. Anyway, this is the kind of idea that you can paint on onto the terrain. In this case, I'm actually just covering it in soil. That's what I was doing. Yeah, that's what is. That's what's happening. I'm overwriting everything with soil. 
Um, but you can also just elevate the terrain, I think, with one of these tools. I'm not sure which one it is. Yeah, as we did a lot of this in Battle Tank. If you guys are interested Sculpt. in terrain sculpting in and Unreal, take a look in Battle Tank. There you go. That's some. Mr. Bailey wants to watch the Unity RPG series. Oh, you can, by the way. You can do that just by going back to our previous videos. Um, I'll see if I can find you a link that gets you there in one step. Uh, I'll see if I can do that because it's all under the RP Unity RPG series. I don't know if this will work for you. Um, I'm going to try giving you a link now. Um, it may not work. I've found it doesn't work unless we're us, but I'll try it. Tell me if this works on a desktop. <laughs> Try that. Cool, Sam. So um, yep. now there's another thing that's completely unique to Unreal, I seem to remember, which is the AI behavior tree and the blackboard type stuff. Do you want to give them a quick shifty at that from, uh, from yeah, testing? Yeah, let's see if I can give an example. I'd need to download the testing grounds repo. Uh -huh. That's fine. Perceptual lucidity, Sam's focus has been Unreal, but you see Unreal's a big engine. And um, if Sam says he's refamiliarizing himself, he means he's refamiliarizing himself with that part of it. He's been full-time Unreal recently, but it's a, it's a big place, a lot of surface area, which is why we're land. stretching ourselves yeah, now it. to go to areas of it we haven't been to recently. So. Yep. Okay, so Sam's pulling the repo for testing grounds, which is the final section of the Unreal course. I'll just give you the uh, link to the Unreal course. I think probably all of you uh, have that course at the moment, but just in case, it would be remiss of me for those new people not to be slamming that in the chat for you there. Yep, uh, in the meantime, we can see about something else, because you were mentioning things like physics, some of the cool physics stuff that's just built in. So any of you guys can get this, by the way, by grabbing Unreal and then going into this content demos um, pack. Was that it? Yep. Content demos. Yeah, a whole yep. load of platform. stuff in there. That's it's a pretty cool way of you just exploring the engine. Great place to be for that. And they set okay, up these so, demos. This is, so these guys are in the middle of an animation. And what I can do is I can blend out their floppiness. <laughs> that is like an overworked soldier. It's like, I'll keep running, but I really am quite tired. <laughs> yeah, all this, all this guy with a, a limp. So this is... This is some of the stuff that you kind of look at. It's got a bit of a lip. Limp leg. Um, or this guy, where you can hit him in places. And uh, it just goes limp on that particular limb. So. Uh, Keith has got a question about, is it hard to switch between engines when you spend a lot of time in one? Yeah, yes and no. Um, yes, in that it's, things are different, things are done a different way. People end up saying things like F vector when they mean vector three, <clears throat> Sam. Um, yeah. Or <laughs> the other way of looking at it is the more that you switch between engines, the more you see the commonalities between them. So the, so on one hand, you're changing some of the specifics. On the other hand, you the more time you spend in between them, the more it's similar between them, and therefore you've got a mental bridge. So probably a bit like yeah, changing so, languages, right? So you can't do it very easily every day, but... Once you get back into context in a certain engine, I think it's very, very straightforward. And what you learned from another engine is so valuable that I think it's definitely worth having both in your toolbox. There you go. Completely. Completely floppy, dude. Anyhow. That's completely floppy. Yeah, so the idea I wanted to show you here is that these actually have uh, deep down an asset editor. So let me see if I can remember where you can get to that. I haven't done that in a while either. So you've got a physics animation blueprint, got a skeletal mesh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on with the skeletal meshes. So I think it's there. I go, now that's an animation. This is the meat, Sam. These are the bits of the engine that people don't even know exist until you eventually click through to something in a dialog box and you're like, wow, there's this whole other editor. So there's this, exactly. So here, the skeletal mesh editor is what we're looking for. So this is a skeletal mesh, the hero TPP skeletal mesh. I go ahead and click on that. And then part, you know, you've got this huge editor here. I'm just going to close down this side window. So Git, don't need that anymore. So... You've got a mesh, but connected 
to the mesh is things like a skeleton asset. And the skeleton asset, as you can see here on the left-hand side, is a whole bunch of roots and such that allow us to actually, I think somewhere here, we should be able to edit the animation. There is an animation asset, um, an animation of physics asset. I'm trying to find where that is. Probably somewhere here in the character. Here we go, SK mannequin physics asset. Let's click on him. There you go. Wow. So, so this is a whole editor just for manipulating the sizes of these capsules around certain bones and which bones they're attached to. You can see that it's basically mimicking the same skeletal structure as that previous skeleton we were looking at. Well, it's actually a slightly different skeleton, but hey. And what we can do is go into this tool panel and you can change the, um, I don't know where, which, which one is it to change the size of this capsule. There's so much to these editors, it's incredible. It's just a full suite of tools, basically. Whereas Unity, you have to add in a lot of um, external tools from time to time to do this sort of stuff. You can just do everything in Unreal. It's got the whole shebang. And a correspondingly steep learning journey, which is why we haven't covered all of Unreal by any means yet. But we're working on it. We've got three right. courses on Unreal, the basic course, the multiplayer, and the VR course, and we will cover more areas of the engine as we go. But it's a it's a lifetime pursuit to get through all of this stuff. Thanks for showing oh, us. It certainly that. is. Looks looks. You can awesome. change all that kind of stuff. So, how about some of this AI behavior scripting? I don't know how your testing grounds blueprint, uh, your testing grounds project's doing. Yeah, it'll need to build. That's the other thing we need to do with it. So, yeah, Unreal super complete, super. It's not cheap. Um, Unreal, 5%, I believe, is still the deal of your revenue. Now, 5% of yeah. revenue is high. You have to have high margins in order to be able to afford 5% off the top. So just bear that in mind. But yeah, pretty complete, and you only pay when you're succeeding. So in those respects, that's good. So it's actually 5% of your total net revenue then? I think so. I think that's still the deal. Oh, it's in that order. Um, I think another killer feature of Unreal certainly is the fact that it, you can get access to all the source code and make total engine modifications. So that's pretty advanced, but- Yeah, even if you don't modify it, which few people do, you, what you do regularly is look into the engine. If you're, if you're not sure what something's doing, you go look at the engine code and you can see what yeah. it's doing, right? And there's so much stuff that they just don't have documentation for because they basically have got loads of stuff. So they haven't managed to write all the documentation, but. For example, what was it that I was looking up the other day? It's something to do with active redirects. So I just go and search for active class and redirect in the whole solution, which includes the engine. But and you can go and find in the in their classic code. style, though, Unity, of course, on the 26th of March announced in this blog post I'm linking in the chat that they're now also releasing the Unity engine source code. So Every Do you time know if they will be able to um, make builds of that, or is it just kind of a read-only source code? I haven't read the blog, but I've just linked the blog. Um, uh, the main advantage we're seeing in Unreal is that you can read the source code. Whether you're going to be able to change it, uh, don't know. I think it's I think it's as a reference is the idea here. Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Right. Yeah, but they're saying very carefully read the license text bef uh, before you get carried away. So. Yeah, awesome. certainly can't uh, can't re-release any of this. Not even Unreal. Absolutely. So I think what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at um, at the AI behavior tree blackboard scripting. Just explain what a blackboard is, what a behavior tree is, what's different about that. Something else very unique to Unreal. And then we'll go into a brief, uh, well, probably a stretch, knowing me. And then a quick Q and uh, not more, not less of a Q and A, and more of a what do you want to see in future streams? Um, which I'll yeah. put a poll up about. Um, I'll do that now. The, the question really is for the future Unreal series, so we're planning on streaming once a week, probably at this time, we might change it. Uh, what do you want to see? Do you want to see engine features that, you, that are unique to Unreal, like we're showing you now? Do you want to see beginner C++ or intermediate C++? What would you most like to see? Slam that, slam, slam that poll. We'd really like to know what to put in the future series. So I know that there's a way in this editor of making the guy collapse, but I can't for the life of me remember what the shortcut is. And it doesn't have any UI to allow you to do it either by the looks of it. 
slightly annoying. That's something we haven't taught yet. Something I want to teach in the new testing grounds, though, is having some ragdoll effects. Awesome. So how's it going? How's the how's the build uh, testing grounds doing? We probably I don't know uh, if we need battle compiling. tank. We're probably done with battle tank. Not planning on revisiting that in this stream. Yeah, it's fine. I've got tons of RAM. Got a bit of a modeling discussion going on in the chat. So in terms of the poll, we are people are most interested in engine features that are unique to well, there's hardly any votes. Let's wait till there's some reasonable number of votes in the in the poll before we yeah. get excited. Hundred percent one. Hundred percent one, so statistical significance of zero. There's a significant clash in the sports world at the moment between Wimbledon, which I'm pretty interested in, and in the World Cup, which I'm not particularly interested in. So uh, that's that's quite interesting. They're kind of all happening at the same time. So a feature oh, unique to Unreal. So obviously you can do anything in either if you make the effort. Compile but, um, errors. What's that? Masses of compile time. That's one feature. Yeah, yeah. We do get we do get a little bit bored of that. We're about to show you something as a, a feature that's unique to Unreal, like the AI behavior tree system that's built in. Uh, Blueprint visual scripting, uh, the way that's built in, although there's third party options in Unity. Um, there's a lot of the asset pipeline stuff we haven't showed you, which we could show you on a future stream, maybe on a blender focus stream. A lot of the way that assets come in and the, and the conditioning of those and what you can do about those and the generation of complex collider meshes. There's loads of things in Unreal that seem only to be in Unreal in terms of our offering. But they come with the weight of having to learn that stuff. So you've got to weigh up how much you need it. Basically, if you're building a game like Unreal, Unreal is your choice because it's already set up to do it. The further you get away from that, the further you get away from its center of gravity, but it's still very capable across the board, you know? Yeah, definitely. It is very flexible as a, as a game, but it does make certain assumptions which make it easier to do games that center around characters, basically. So if your game goes quite far away from that, or 2D games, I don't know, it does have 2D setup support. I've never actually dived into it. So that might be something that is uh, less powerful because they put a lot of force into they put a lot of time and energy thinking about how to make the engine look really pretty. So I'm not actually sure. I think I've got an upgrade issue here in terms of testing grounds. So I don't think I'm going to be able to get this running on the stream. OK, well, that's not a problem, but you could probably take a blank project and go to the AI behavior tree. Couldn't you do need do you need much to do that? Well, I'll just be better to show. Uh, there may even be some in battle tank. Um, no, there isn't any. There isn't actual AI, but we can create some AI assets. So I can go ahead and create a behavior tree of any sort. So and that menu you in a moment ago just shows how much the richness there. When you right clicked and said, create an asset, look at the amount of stuff here. Yeah, yeah, in, that's right? the new, yeah new great advanced function. asset, animation, AI assets, blendables, blueprints, materials, textures. Oh. Anyway, just to give you an idea, paper 2D is the part of the 2D system you were talking about. Media asset. It's just an overview. Yeah, We're trying exactly. to just keep it at a so cool. Let's see this behavior tree and understand a little bit about what it's like. What's this blackboard thing for that we, we used in, in testing grounds? Yeah. And so, on. so a basically the behavior tree is a way of programming your AI to do tasks a bit at a time. Uh, so you can compose behaviors and such as you can give it a task to do. Uh, let's see if we've got some existing tasks that I could use. We want a sequence, so make a sequence of events which basically says do task one, then do task two, then do task three, etc. And we can do tasks such as make a noise, not very useful. We can do tasks such as play an animation, so this might be a uh, scratch head animation. Um, this we could do a wait, then get it to wait for five seconds, and then we might get it to do a move to which gets it to do some AI navigation. So this sets up a very simple little behavior for our AI, where it might make a grunt, then play a scratching animation, then do a wait for five seconds, then move to the next destination that it's patrolling to, for example. And you can sequence these things together. You can do other things to aggregate, such as a selector. So it might choose to, I don't know, it could choose between multiple animations. Let's try and do that. So 
instead of just playing one animation, you might get it to run a selector of animations, in which case it will randomly pick between one or the other. We get a couple of animations in here, like so. We have um, a couple of questions about this. We have, is there an advantage, I'm just trying to clarify with Kin Thaman, something like that, is there an advantage between a behavior tree and just creating a graph? Well, I'm not entirely sure about what you mean by just creating a graph. Do you understand the question, Sam? No, I don't quite understand the question. Um, okay, so we'll get what some... kind of graph? Yeah, and graphs kind of graph. are incredibly, incredibly general. In, in, um, yeah, what kind of graph in where, where? And the other question was, um, is this a weighted task tree? Perceptual Lucidity Games is asking. Weighted in what sense? Yeah, and it doesn't it mean weight as in, you know, I don't, I don't think it's weighted. It's just a sequencing tool is really what we're talking about here. Yeah, and the thing is you can build them up, you can extract things like this out, I think, to make this into a, another task, you could get it to run another behavior tree, yeah. so that you can compose really co much more complex sequences of things like walk up to door, try to unlock door, open door, um, go close door, etc. And that can, you can be very complex behavior built up in, in levels of abstraction. Awesome. And, it's, okay. quite, and it's quite easy for someone who is not a programmer to use this to put together and tweak the AI behavior. So if you've got a designer who needs to say, oh, actually, this AI should wait 10 more seconds uh, or it should wait between opening the door and closing the door, then you can they can just go ahead and do that. It's very easy and straightforward. It's a restricted programming model that allows them to do that. And at runtime, you can inspect and see where a given AI is in their behavior tree, which is quite helpful. So that's all good stuff. Yeah, all right, absolutely. so stretch your clock. We're going to quickly stand up. I'm going to go to standing. And then I think what we need to do is just uh, spend the last few minutes of this stream assessing what people want in future streams. So far, the poll is pretty across the board. People are wanting to see a bit of unique things that are unique to Unreal, a bit of beginner C++ and a bit of intermediate C++. So it looks like we'll have to do uh, slightly across the board. What we might do is announce... Um, announce a stream for next week which is announced to our unreal students saying hey what do you, come come with questions basically come with a project come with questions uh that type of thing uh, and, and we'll find we have to find our feet with that with each series we have to find our feet and decide uh you know where we're going with it so quick stretch yeah. and then we'll, we'll dive into that bear with me so guys stand up if you will uh and give maybe you as well sam let's all let's all move yeah. You're already standing. Sam's, Sam's already standing. I'm still standing. Better than I ever have. So I like you just didn't rotation. notice me transitioning find, to standing. Find the movements that are right for you, right? So for my particular body, I have thoracic spine slightly, slightly immobile. I like to, like to get my arms stretched like this. I'm always doing the same things. I like to make sure the shoulder's moving. But, you know, everyone has their own gripes. Just listen to your body. Move it how you need to. Uh, we had Jonathan Weinberg was doing star jumps. He seemed to like that. He seemed to want to be moving like that. <laughs> Um, whatever you like, just just move yourself regularly, guys. Just you don't, you don't have to break your focus or distraction. Uh, maybe you stand and oh, do the tree. I can often help. What's that? I find I find very often. Yeah, I often stand and do the tree. So the tree is like it. this. Uh, yeah, Sam. Sam will show you the tree. There you go. So one tree. one foot on your on your uh, on your knee basically, and then you stand on one leg. That's quite good for balance. Lots of things. Lots of good stuff that you can try. Yeah. All right, and you so can also see that I'm actually wearing trousers, which is That's cool. lucky. <laughs> so let's spend a few minutes then assessing what people want to see of the Unreal series. There's no good asking if this is a good time of day because we'll have horrible confirmation bias because this is the time of day. You could probably stop <laughs> sharing the screen, Sam, as, we wind, it, as, as yep. we wind it to a halt because they probably want to see your hair in more detail, I would have thought. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> Could do a hair close up. You can do a hair close up. There you go. So there's, <laughs> you can do a hair close up, and we can do a beard close up on there me. <laughs> I've had a little bit of beard jealousy lately. The fact I can grow a beard like that in about three days flat. I've had a few friends say they'd like a beard, but they can't grow it fast enough. So I'm like, at least I've got some hair yeah. left. We're going to be moving into the realms of more. I've on got the it on my head. Head. I don't have it on my beard. <laughs> awesome. So, guys, uh, we will be doing another stream at the same time next week. We'll come with general Unreal stuff until we find our feet. I don't really feel like we've uh, understood exactly exactly what should be most regularly in it. People are seeming to like uh, unique features, but not surprising when we've just done a stream about unique features. Um, I think we need to stay super beginner to keep it accessible, so maybe some super we beginner bits. We could do a highlight of um, particular features if you like. So if there's any features we've covered in the stream today and you'd like to see more of, 
we could uh, do a little bit of prep and show you that so that I've actually done it before rather than just doing it for the first time on the stream. And we could also potentially crack open Visual Studio and do something that's totally non uh, Unreal and look at some very basic generic C++. That's another option. Yeah, absolutely. We can teach you about some C++ hot topics as well. Yeah, nice. You some templating or some, um, or even more beginner than that. Yeah, cool. All right, I think we need to wind up the stream. We'll we'll book another one for next week, and I will look forward yep. to seeing you seeing you on it. It's been really good. Thank you, guys. Cheers, guys. Take <laughs> care. Right. See ya.